Welcome to Numerical Methods. And today we start a new section discussing the numerical approximation of partial derivatives. And this is a nice one. Well, the mathematics is maybe simple, trivial. Yeah, we will derive several approximation formulas in a straightforward way from the Taylor expansion. But uh, there is a subtle thing here if we do it numerically in the computer. So this relates back to the teaser I had at the beginning of the lecture. So maybe you recall that at the beginning of the lecture, I already discussed this problem, approximating a partial derivative, a derivative with a finite difference yeah, for a small shift here. I was looking at an example where the function that we approximate is here the exponential. And well, the code to implement this is simple, but you discover actually that you have strange errors yeah, if you use small shift sizes. Okay, numerical approximation of partial derivatives. So what I would like to do, I have a function, say V, a certain valuation that we would like to differentiate with respect to a parameter X. So I would like to calculate dV by dX. And we can approximate this, for example, with a finite difference. Yeah? So calculate the function V at a shifted value, so that's V of X plus H, subtract the unshifted value, the V of X, and divide by the shift size H. So I consider a function V that depends on some parameters, say X1 to Xn. So V is a function of x1 to xn. The function should be sufficiently smooth, yeah? and we are now interested in calculating numerically the partial derivative of this function with respect to one of its arguments, yeah? say, for example, dv by dxi. This also allows us to calculate the directional derivatives, the gradient, yeah? This is the element of the gradient vector. And in our application of mathematical finance, the V could be, for example, the valuation of a financial derivative. So my V here is the value of a financial derivative. And now the important thing is that the V could be itself a numerical algorithm. So V could be your Monte Carlo approximation of the valuation of the financial derivative. This is actually a thing that makes the situation even more complicated, which we will not look at in this session, but I already consider it a little bit later. So we could have additional errors, additional errors in the approximation. So this V is then in our application a function of your parameters. These parameters are model parameters, product parameters, yeah, the initial value of the stock, the interest rate, the volatility parameter, yeah, this Black-Scholes model, the implied Black-Scholes volatility, and also product parameters like the maturity or the strike. And you have an underlying model where all these uh, parameters enter and you can now ask yourself, uh, what is the change in the value when one of these parameters changes? So this is looking at the partial derivative. For example, how does the value of the financial product changes if the initial value of the stock that you assumed in your model changes? And you know that this quantity, the dV by ds0, is an important one in our application because it is the amount of stocks that you need to perform replication of the financial derivative. You can easily see this if you subtract that amount of stocks in a portfolio from your financial derivative, then this means that 
the partial derivative with respect to the initial value of the stock price is zero no? because holding that much that many stocks has the same derivative as your financial derivative. So holding that amount of stocks, yeah, or with a plus or minus, yeah, shortening that amount of stocks neutralizes the risk of your financial derivative. So it is the quantity that you need to perform the hedging, the risk neutral trading strategy. So the partial derivatives are very important in um, our application. Yeah, we have you know the modulation algorithm given, and calculating the partial derivatives tells us something how we should do the replication of this financial derivative. These arguments to our financial derivative, so our financial product V, yeah. So these arguments that I mentioned, x1 to xn. There could be many different quantities, like for example, the initial value of the spot, sorry, like for example, the initial value of the stock, yeah? So the spot value of the equity stock, but there could also be other quantities like the foreign currency exchange rate. Or if you now look at an interest rate model, it could be a parameter describing the interest rate curve, like the parameter R in the Black-Scholes model. Or if you have a complex interest rate model, like a forward rate model, the vector of forward rates that you observe today. Could also be a credit spread curve, yeah? So the default probability, a quantity that describes the default probability of a quantity yeah, that enters into your model for the default time. It could be the volatility parameter yeah, or any combinations of these guys. Yeah? So we will in application calculate partial derivatives with all these parameters. So these parameters are called uh, risk factors because they describe the risk in the sense what happens to the value when some of these observed quantities changes uh, and putting the derivative to zero by a trading strategy means reducing the risk yeah, because the dependency on a certain parameter on a certain risk factor is removed yeah so far to the motivation for the discussion of the numerical methods it's sufficient to just consider a single parameter here yeah? so i have just a single parameter x now that enters here in my function v and we are interested in the derivative of v with respect to to x okay so we will derive the finite difference approximation of these derivatives so let's start with first order derivative but if you see how we derive this you immediately get the idea of also deriving higher order derivatives like the second order derivative. So all is based on the Taylor expansion. So assume that we have a sufficiently smooth function V. We have a parameter X and we consider a shift size H, a shift H, and then consider the Taylor expansion up to order n. So that means I can represent now the function at the shifted value x plus h by the function at the unshifted value. And now comes the Taylor expansion plus the first derivative of the function with respect to x multiplied with h plus the second derivative of the function multiplied with h squared half and so on. Yeah. And then the nth derivative of the function with respect to x multiplied with h to the power of n divided by faculty of n. Plus a residual term. And my residual term here, this is the 
n plus one's derivative of the function multiplied with h to the power of n plus one divided by n plus one faculty. This residual term evaluates the derivative at an intermediate point xi, so where the xi comes from the interval from x to x, x plus h. So now we will use this formula by taking different values for the order n. So we go up to several orders here. You see you have as many derivatives as I have orders. And I have an h to the power of n plus 1 in my residual term. And I will use this formula for different values of the shift. So approximation for the first order derivative, we will now calculate the forward finite difference by using now our parameter n to be equal to one. Yeah? So Taylor expansion with n equals to one. So what we have is that the value of my function at the upshifted point is equal to the value of the function at the unshifted point. So let's move this to the other side. So upshifted value minus unshifted value is equal to the partial derivative, the first order derivative of my function multiplied with h plus my residual term here. So second derivative add some value c plus multiplied with h squared half. So now what can we do? Yeah, we move our residual term with a minus yeah, to the other side. And then I divide here with the h and I have a formula for the first derivative, first order derivative. So this formula is now just the upshifted value minus the unshifted value divided by h minus my residual term divided by h, so minus my residual term divided by h, so the residual term had an h squared half, so now it has an h divided by two, yeah? so my error term is minus second derivative at some intermediate point, multiplied with h divided by two. So this guy is now considered to be so this guy is now considered to be an error term because you see that this one is small if the h is small. So if you make the shift size smaller and forget about this term, you have an approximation for the partial derivative of v at x. Let's use this formula now again with n equals one, but now with a different shift. Yeah. So what we will do is we will replace the h with a minus h, and this gives us the backward finite difference. So it means that now you have the value that is downshifted. So if you go back and look at this formula and you replace the h with a minus h, yeah, you will have a minus h here, but then you divide by a minus h, which means that you have a minus here and you flip the two. Huh? So it's just the unshifted value minus the downshifted value. And you get another minus here, so you could consider here a plus. So you have the unshifted value minus the downshifted value now in the formula if you move to minus h. So that is the unshifted value minus the downshifted value divided by h yeah, plus your residual term. And now, of course, also your residual term is evaluate the second derivative at an intermediate point, and the intermediate point is now from the interval from x minus h to h, 
second derivative evaluated at this point multiplied by h divided by 2. This gives you now also an approximation, different approximation, for the partial derivative. This is called the backward finite difference. Yeah. So if x yeah, plus is forward, minus is backward. And again, I have here an error term that has the property that it becomes smaller if h becomes smaller. So if you drop this guy, yeah, you drop an error of order h. If you make h small, you have hope that this here is a good approximation for your partial derivative. Let's consider now our Taylor expansion with n equals 2. So I will consider the Taylor expansion with in equals two. Yeah, that means uh, I get also the second derivative term in my Taylor expansion. So I have the first derivative multiplied with h plus the second derivative multiplied with h squared half. And then my residual term is the third derivative at some intermediate point multiplied with h to the power of 3 divided by 6. Let's use this formula with two different shift sizes, namely the upshift, the plus h, and the downshift, the minus h. So for the upshift, this is just the formula v of x plus h minus the unshifted value is equal to the first derivative times h, second derivative times h squared half plus residual term. Yeah, and for the downshift, yeah, you just replace again the h with a minus h. So you have now the downshifted value minus the unshifted value. This and then exactly the same expression, but just replace h with minus h. Of course, the residual term is evaluated at a different point, xi minus, yeah, where xi minus is between x minus h and x. So the two residual terms you have to be careful are evaluated at different different points. Okay, there is a, a general a scheme behind this here. So first look when you increase the n here, you will get more partial derivatives. So in our case, since we just have a single argument x, yeah, for n equals 2, we get two derivatives. So we get exactly n derivatives, namely with the corresponding order. Yeah? First order 1, second order 1. If I use different values of the shift h, I get different equations. Yeah? So this here is h, and this here is minus h. I get different equations. So I get as many unknown derivatives as I have the order n, and I get as many equations as I use shifts. So now here I have two equations with two unknowns. So I can actually solve for the both, for the two unknowns, for the first derivative and the second derivative. So let's solve for the first derivative because this is just now about deriving approximation for the first derivative, but you also see that you would get the second derivative out of this. Yeah, if I would like to solve for the first derivative, I would like to cancel this guy here. Yeah, canceling this guy, you observe this is here the same. It means that you just subtract the two equations. So subtracting the two equations, yeah, this will then cancel this part here. Okay, if you subtract the two equations, you get from h minus minus h, you get a 2h. Since I would like to get the first derivative, I will divide by the 2h. 
So and divide by the 2h. This means, okay, we did a subtraction. This means the value v at the upshifted point, x plus h, minus the unshifted value, but then subtracting the second equation gives me a minus minus, a plus, the unshifted value. So this guy is also cancelling by subtracting the two equations. So what you just left with is the upshifted value minus the downshifted value divided by 2h. And of course, the difference of the two residual terms. Yeah, But note that this guy here has a plus and this guy here has a minus. Yeah, So it's actually then if you subtract the sum of the two residual terms and then we move the residual term to the other side and get here a minus. Yeah, So it's minus the sum of the two residual terms. So I have that this is minus the error term from the upshift plus the error term from the downshift. Both are evaluated here at different points, C plus and C minus. And I divide by 2H, so what we get is an H squared divided by 12. Yeah, and you have a, another formula for your first derivative. Upshifted value minus downshifted value divided by 2h minus an error term. And now you can simplify this part here. So the c plus is from x to x plus h, and the c minus is from x minus h to x. So there is some point c in the interval from x minus h to x plus h such that the third derivative at this point has the same value as one half of the sum of the two third derivatives at the two different points. Yeah? There has to be a point in between point yeah, that is the average of the of the two Yeah, if the function is continuous. Yeah? So Maybe if you like to have a picture, yeah, you have a function value here, you have a function value here, yeah. The average is is in between. And if the function is continuous, there has to be some point where we cross where we cross this, yeah. So there's some C yeah, where where I have one half of this plus one half of this, yeah. This is this is the average here, where the function crosses the average. It's a detail anyway, yeah, because uh I just consider um, it as an error term, and the error term, the order of the error term stays the same, h squared divided by something. And you have here a single third derivative. Yeah. So multiplied now with h squared divided by 6, Yeah, because it replaces the two terms divided by 6. But that's just a detail because we will consider this guy here anyway as an error term. So again, I have the situation that this guy here is small if h is small. And you have another approximation for your partial derivative of the function. And now this approximation goes upshifted value minus downshifted value divided by 2h. You see that in this central finite difference, so what we just derived was the central finite difference, our error term has a different order. So this guy is now order of h squared. Yeah? So approximation error is much smaller if h is small compared to the backward finite difference where we just had an order of h and the forward finite difference. So using more points, more shifts, yeah, gives you more equations. 
then you can increase the Taylor expansion to higher orders because you have more equations to cancel the other terms and the order of the error term increases. Yeah, you see that the order of the error term corresponds to the n yeah, that we used in our Taylor formula. Yeah? The error term in our Taylor formula was an h to the power of n plus 1, but we divided by 1 h because we considered the first derivative. Yeah? So we lost here one exponent. So we have an order of n. Yeah, summary, we have already three nice, yeah, maybe well-known formulas. There is the forward finite difference. So you see here in the picture, this is, if you take this slope here, yeah, from evaluating at x to evaluating at x plus h, this is my forward finite difference approximation. Okay, this is now upshifted value minus unshifted value divided by h. You have the backward finite difference. So this is if you go from x minus h to x yeah, and look at the slope of this. So this is unshifted value minus downshifted value divided by h. This gives you the backward finite difference approximation. And we have the central finite difference approximation if you go from x minus h to x plus h, yeah, which is a little bit better yeah, because it will already average the bias yeah, that we get by looking at just one side. Yeah, It will average this bias away. So I have the central finite difference approximation if I take the upshifted value minus the downshifted value divided by 2h. And I can summarize that we have different approximation errors, yeah, different orders for the approximation error. So for the central finite difference approximation, we get an order h squared error. And for the backward finite difference approximation and the forward finite difference approximation, we get an order h approximation error. So that was it for deriving a finite difference approximation to partial derivatives. And you already saw how you get higher order derivatives yeah, in the same way by setting up the equations yeah, using different shift sizes to get as many equations as you need to cancel all the other derivatives yeah, except the one that you are interested in. So this lemma here now suggests that we should take h as small as possible. Now we should take h small uh, to achieve a very low approximation error. Uh, in the end, the derivative is defined as the limit of that finite difference for h going to zero. However, I have an example that illustrates that this is not true. It's a numerical experiment that shows us that we should not use h as small as possible.